Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Originals channel, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variations using large samples of language data. Now, Corpus Cast is the series all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. And in this new series, I'll be speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas, including health, social justice, education, and many, many others. We're going to be starting here with a limited series of three episodes, and based on your feedback, um, we'll, we'll be deciding whether to, to continue with more. So hopefully you'll enjoy it, and if you enjoy it a lot, we'll be coming back with even more than our first three episodes. So in this first episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is how Corpus Linguistics contributes to research about social justice. And I'll be speaking to Paul Baker, who's professor of English language at Lancaster University. Paul is renowned for his expertise in Corpus Linguistics, language and identities and critical discourse analysis and has many publications on topics including Polari, the lost language of gay men, uh, language and gender, and health communication. But it's his research into the language of news reporting around minority groups and the impacts of this research that I'll be discussing with Paul today. So I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Paul Baker to Corpus Cast. Hello, Paul, and welcome. Nice to see Hi. you. Hi, Robbie, and it's great to be your first guest. <laughs> well, you know, there's a first time for everything, and I, I'm so thrilled that you uh, agreed to join us. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Now, now, Paul, we, we've known each other for uh, a few years. Uh, back when I was at uh, Lancaster doing my PhD, we even uh, did some research together. So it's, it's great to uh, reconnect with you in this hybrid online <laughs> format um, for the first episode of Corpus Cast. So before we get into the details of, of the research that, that I just mentioned there, I want to ask you a couple of general questions. Corpus linguistics. What does corpus linguistics mean to you personally? Ooh, well, it's, it's the idea of studying language by looking at real life uses and using computers to examine large enough amounts of language so your findings can be generalized outside of the data set that you've collected. And I think people at first who don't know it very well see it as kind of just involving computers and maths and they see it as very quantitative and it's a bit like Star Trek where you just ask the computer for the answer and then you get the answer straight away. But really the computer is just there to do all the donkey work for you. It'll tell you what words and phrases are more frequent than it's expecting to find. But then it's up to you to figure out why that's the case. So it ends up actually being very qualitative in terms of the analysis you do. You have to go into text and do a lot, quite a detailed analysis by hand to make sense of what's happening um, with certain words. And it's not really a single method. There's not a kind of walkthrough set of steps. It's a set of techniques and you have to decide which ones to apply and also what counts then as an important finding. And I think for me, a lot of it is kind of in making a, a narrative out of lots of different findings, something that's going to be interesting. So it's a kind of way of making the life of a linguist easier. But unfortunately, well, fortunately, it doesn't make us redundant. We still have a lot of work to do. So it's it's not just pressing buttons and getting numbers out and going, oh, look at that. Isn't that interesting? But there's there's a lot of uh, interpretive work to be done as well. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, that is where the fun of it is, I think, really. Um, the, the computer stuff, they do the computers do the boring stuff, I think, really, the counting and the sorting and things like that. It would be very tedious for humans to actually have to do. And then we can get down to the, the more interesting things. OK, thank you. So um, this, you know, for some might seem like quite a, a niche thing to get into and certainly something that we don't often hear about in school when we're when we're growing up. So how on earth did you end up getting into this uh, as uh, and you've made such a successful career out of it? How, how did you get started in corpus linguistics in the first place? Oh, God. Um, so go back to the 1990s, the early 1990s, and there was a recession on and there were very few graduate jobs. I remember I was applying for loads of different jobs and having some very strange job interviews where they made me make triangles out of matchsticks and things like that. And there were jobs that I didn't actually want anyway, I remember. And then I heard about this post that had come up at Lancaster in linguistics. Um, I was quite desperate at this point for a job. Um, so a researcher had left a project and they needed someone to fill in at short notice. And 
I had I didn't have a linguistics degree. I did my master's in psychology, but there was a lot of language based modules in there. So I'd done discourse analysis and child language and um, conversation analysis, things like that. So I thought, well, you know, I'll give it a try. So they made me do a grammar test um, and I spent the whole week reading grammar books and kind of swatting up on it. Um, I think I must have got a high enough score because they gave me the job. And it was a job working with this British National Corpus, which had just been created um, and had been part of speech tagged by a computer program. So the program had kind of gone through the whole corpus and added code to every word based upon whether it was a, a singular common noun. I think that's NN1 or a general superlative adjective, which I think is JJT. Um, you still got this, it. <laughs> this program was only about 96% accurate. Um, so my job was to check all the files of this 100 million word corpus. Um, and then change the mistakes that the computer had made by hand, and then think about new rules to develop um, this tagging system. Now, it wasn't the most exciting job in the world, I have to admit, um, but I, I did learn a lot about part of speech tagging, and I also started to see the potential for using the corpus, not just to look at language in its own right, but to look at how language could be used to influence people's attitudes and beliefs, which is done in quite a subtle way. And, and techniques within corpus linguistics, that collocation, I think, can help us to spot the ways that words and concepts get repeatedly paired together. I remember one of the early pieces of work I did was looking at representations of refugees in the news and how the word refugee often appears next to lots of water metaphors, words like floods and flows and streams and waves and things like that. And it felt at the time that this was a technique that had so much untapped potential. And you know, people weren't using corpus linguistics to do this at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and I was in a department which had a lot of corpus people, um, people like Jeffrey Leach and, and Tony McHenry. And then there was another set of people who did critical discourse analysis and people like Norman Fairclough and, and Ruth Vodak. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be nice to kind of combine these two fields together and like make a new field? Um, and, and no one seemed to be doing that. So I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll give that a go. And, and that's how it all started. <laughs> Wow. So you went from uh, tagging, uh, correcting errors in, in tagging and, and that really, you know, laborious and boring task didn't put you off. Um, <laughs> and, and then, did. you know, a few years down the line, you end up essentially creating this new hybrid field of, of corpus linguistics and, and discourse analysis. What a story. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think, think there's was the right place who, at the right time. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a lot of people who are glad that, who are glad that you weren't put off. I, I'm pretty sure. Um, now, yeah, you, you you talked there about about starting to look at the the way that language can be um, used to or manipulated to to present certain people in a certain way, and um, I wanted to to sort of start really by asking you about some of the work that you are most well known for, looking at representations of uh, Islam and Muslims in the British press, and and you uh, since developing this this field of combining corpus linguistics with discourse now so have become very well known for that and you've published a lot of books in this area but um looking at um muslims and and islam particularly um what what sort of led you into this area but and, and what have you what have you found across your your body of work in 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 this area of inquiry okay so the way it started, it was a study I, I did with Tony McHenry um, and Costas Gabrielatos, um, which we did around about 2009. And I remember there was the terror attacks on London transport in 2005. And I remember reading a lot of coverage around Islam and Muslims in the British press around that date and then afterwards as well. And we were kind of aware that there's work, there had been work going on looking at representations of Islam in the press, a lot of it very good and useful. Um, it tended to be of two types. It was either very small scale and qualitative and quite detailed analysis of a small number of newspapers over a short period, or a large scale analysis, which was kind of more like a content analysis where they kind of identified themes um, or they looked at pictures and things like that with, within articles and then categorized them. So we thought it would be useful to look at the subject by taking a different approach, a more, a more corpus based approach. And um, we got funding from ESRC um, to, to do the research. We, we got a researcher, then we built the corpus and we also developed methods of the analysis as we went along. So we had a decade of data. We started in 1998, and we, the last date was 2009. And we looked at 12 national newspapers in the in the UK. And in terms of the findings, I think probably the biggest finding we had was that words relating to terrorism in this big corpus were actually more frequent than the words relating to Islam. So if you wanted to categorize the corpus by what the language was about, you'd say it was first and foremost a corpus about terror, 
rather than a corpus about Islam. And this was despite the fact that we'd specified that all the articles had to contain at least one word relating to Islam, like Muslim or Islam. But we didn't say that any of the articles had to contain references to terror. Um, we also mm. did an analysis of lots of other nouns and verbs and adjectives in the corpus. We categorized them according to themes. And we found that about half of these words related to conflict in some way. And I remember we thought, well, maybe that's just the job of newspapers. Maybe that's what they do. They just write about conflict a lot. So to test that out, we did the same thing on two other sets of randomly collected newspaper articles. But they didn't report on conflict anywhere near to the same extent. And it was a statistically significant difference. So there was definitely something interesting going on there. There was also a lot of focus on extremism. Um, so about one in 20 references to the word Muslim occurred next to a, a word like fanatic or militant. Um, and that figure gets to be one in six for the word Islamic. But if you look at a word like moderate, that only occurs maybe one in 200 times in reference to Muslims. And even a word like devout, um, which sounds like you know quite a reasonably positive word, was often used to imply something a bit strange or sinister was going on. And I remember there being an example, I think it's something like, um, he was a devout Muslim, but he was a normal kid who loved Manchester United. And the implication is that you know if you're a devout Muslim, that you're not normally a normal kid and you don't normally support football teams. So it was, it was quite quite negative stuff we, we were finding in this thing. And it was the, the kind of subtle repetition of patterns over and over again across a, a decade, across lots of newspapers that we were able to kind of to mark out. Um, and it wasn't what we were expecting to find. We didn't really know what we were going to find, but, but the computer software kind of told us where to look and what was interesting. Goodness. So you, you noticed these really dominant uh, patterns, if you will. I suppose we can call them patterns when we're looking at such large data sets. How, do you know roughly how, how big this, this corpus was that you looked at? I mean, what's the sort of scale that we're, we're talking about here? I think it was about 130 million words, something like that. It was, it was, it was, it was a bit bigger than the British National Corpus anyway, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's, it's incredible that you could, you know, look through without, you know, this, this is what corpus linguistics is. You're not, you're not having to sit and read every single article word by word because that that would just take no. forever and you don't get i like to call it a bird's eye view over over the articles in in this way um did you notice any patterns between different categories of of the press say between the broadsheets and and the tabloids for instance was was it kind of the same across the board or were there any differences there, there were quite a few so Newspapers like The Guardian and The Independent, the more liberal broadsheet ones, I think they did try a bit harder to be more balanced. Um, the Guardian mentioned and the concept of Islamophobia and it kind of monitored the other newspapers, kind of like watched over them and commented on them when they, when they thought they were stepping out of line. Um, the Independent made the most effort to talk about different branches of Islam, like Sunni and Shia, whereas the other newspapers tended to just lump everything together as Islam, which is, which is you know, they don't do with Christianity. They do, they do make distingu distinguishments there. Sometimes the liberal broadsheets had a bit of an ambivalent stance when they talked about feminism and the intersection of that with Islam, especially around wearing the veil, and they just couldn't make up their mind about whether they were okay with it or not. But the conservative newspapers didn't really have that dilemma, and we called it kind of what they did, a horror discourse around the veil. So they likened women who wore veils to, to bats, Daleks, um, zombies, and even um, Darth Vader, I think, in one article. Um, so quite, quite unpleasant um, kind of articles there. Um, we also found a couple of newspapers, I think it was the Mail and the Express, they used the term Muslim, so that's spelled M-O-S-L-E-M, -E um, rather than Muslim. And we weren't sure why they were doing this, and we had to kind of look outside the corpus, and we found this um, kind of whole thing where the Muslim Council of Britain had written to them, these newspapers, and said, will you please stop using that spelling? It's, we don't like it. It's quite similar to the Arabic word for oppressor. Um, and the Express was like, okay, we, we, we'll stop doing it, and they made the change straight away. But the mail kind of held out for a year um, using it before, before it kind of caved and dropped the spelling as well. Um, and one thing we were quite interested in is how newspapers managed to get away with, with so much negativity um, when, you know, when there's this press complaints commission and you can complain and get things retracted. And they had various ways around it. So one thing they did was um, you can get away with quite, saying quite offensive things as long as it's labelled as opinion or an opinion column. So oh. that was one of the kind of get out clauses they had. Um, and they also used readers, readers' letters as well, which were sometimes just wrong or, or, you know, kind of quite inflammatory on purpose. So I remember there was a there was a story in the Star um, about banks banning pig, piggy banks because Muslims might be offended. And the article actually had a quote 
from a Muslim member of parliament who said that Muslims would not be offended by you know, banks banning piggy banks. Right. But then the next day, the newspaper published letters from readers who'd written in to complain about Muslims being offended by the piggy banks. And I kind of thought, you know, if you hadn't read the first article, you'd kind of read that sec those letters and you'd think that there was all these Muslims out there who were kind of getting upset by piggy banks, um, which, you know, just, just wasn't really the case. Um, so it was kind of things like that where, you know, we started you know, with a very looking at something very big and broad, almost like using a telescope. And then, you know, the kind of cops analysis kind of gets, gets to, gets to focus in. And then we can look at things like you know, using a microscope in, in, in quite a lot of detail. Um, so that was quite, quite helpful, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, I mean, it's just shocking hearing some of, some of these examples that, that you're giving. And it's hard to believe that even so recently, this was the, the sort of discourse that, that you'd find. Um, I want to also uh, talk to you about your, your work into um, another uh, often uh, un unfairly treated group in society as well. But first, I, I think it would be interesting to touch on okay, we're, we're, you're noticing all these patterns in the press and you're noticing unfair or completely inaccurate representations around a certain group. But corpus linguistics often, in, in, at least in critical discourse analysis, is interested in press reporting. I just wonder if you could touch on, you know, what what is the, the motivation behind that? How, just how powerful and influential uh, is the press? Um, and and do the discourses you you observe? It's kind of like the chicken and the egg, or chicken or the egg. You know, are they creating public opinion, or are they simply reflecting public opinion, or both? How important is it to look at representations in the press specifically? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think one of the, one of the reasons why we started doing it is that it was just so easy to collect the data. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's available in those, these big kind of archives online, and you can just specify search words and then newspapers and dates, and then it downloads for you, you know, you can do it fairly quickly, you know, in, in a few days, you can get 130 million words quite, quite on a topic quite easily. Um, and our university subscribed to those databases. So, you know, so there was a kind of, you know, a kind of accessibility issue there, which was which was very attractive to us, the way we could get, get the data. Um, people have said, you know, oh, newspapers aren't as popular, you know, or as influential as they used to be because of social media and, and things like Twitter. And that's where opinions get formed. But when you look at social media, a lot of the people who are kind of giving giving their opinions are actually getting them from from newspapers in the first place. And a lot of newspapers are online anyway now, mm -hmm. and some are behind firewalls, but a lot aren't. And there's a lot of sharing on, online of articles and things. So I think they still are incredibly influential. And I, I just know, and kind of even anecdotally from from my own family members, see, seeing how family members have changed and reading their newspapers, and, and then and like a few weeks later, their political views have kind of shifted quite dramatically as well, um, quite markedly. So. Um, I, I do, I do think think that they definitely have a a role to play. I think in in people's um, beliefs and, and attitudes. Um, in a country like the UK, you know, the press is multiple. You've got these different different types of newspapers, and they reflect different different social views, I guess, really. Um, and they and newspapers do have to chase after audiences. They're there to make money. If they published unpopular opinions, they'd lose readers. And I think you're right. There is a sense that they are social barometers. Um, and no newspaper can really, though, cover a majority of people. Mm. Um, but I do think they play an important role in terms of leading as well as following um, or reflecting back what, what people think. So day after day, they choose which topics to focus on, which ones they won't talk about. And then they frame those topics in certain ways. And they use the kinds of language that they know are going to influence readers. And I think now more than ever, they've got this down to a fine art or a science. With online articles, they know who clicks on which headlines the most and how long readers stay on a page reading an article. And then they got all information based upon um, reader comments and feedback as well. So I think they can take that information and they can learn for it, from it when writing new articles to kind of make people engage even more with, with their website so they get more, more clicks and then more advertising revenue, things like that. And I think a lot of news reporting these days is really designed to grab your attention and it engages with negative emotions a lot more now than ever before. And these are emotions like anger, anger and fear and envy, um, unfortunately, which is not a good thing. No, uh, absolutely. It, it's interesting that you you say you can almost observe um, uh, a, a line of, of progression from a lot of the discourses from the press, even if, for instance, printed newspapers are read less than they were 
a few decades ago. The online versions certainly are not in the same situation. And those threads of argumentation are trickling through into social media um, and, you know, still in a way as pervasive as, as they ever have been. So I think that provides a really good justification for why it's so important to look at look at press language it's um it's really fascinating it really is um i want to uh turn as i as i said before to uh another area and and you started researching um this uh almost 10 years ago 10 years ago now and this is a representation of transgender people again in 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 the press and i know you've returned to that more recently and and, and certainly this seems to be something that is um very much uh, a big topic of discussion in the press again uh, today and in public discourse in general. So I wonder if you could go back to when you started looking at this um, back in 2012, I think it was, what was the the, the landscape there in terms of representations of, of trans people when you started mm. looking at it? So I was kind of inspired to, to do this. I remember there was a, the context was initially there was a school teacher called Lucy Meadows um, who, who had transitioned, and she'd been the focus of an article by um, Richard Littlejohn in the Daily Mail, and Littlejohn had said, he is putting his own selfish needs ahead of the well-being of the children he's taught, or something like that. And then Lucy Meadows committed suicide three months later, and at her inquest, the coroner said to the press, shame on you. Mm. And mm. You know, I think you think, well, okay, it's the Daily Mail, it's, you know, it, it's quite a conservative kind of newspaper, maybe that's what you'd expect. But I remember around the same time in The Observer, which is a much more liberal broadsheet, there was another columnist called Julie Birchill, and she'd published an article where she'd used phrases like um, a bunch of bedwetters in bad wigs, mm. and she'd refer to what she called the very vociferous transsexual lobby. And there were lots of complaints about this article. I remember it was kind of taken down quite quickly from the Observer website. People complained about it, but she was found not to have breached the Complaints Commission Code of Practice. Um, so there's a lot of kind of talk about those two articles. They got a lot of attention, and I wondered if they were one-offs or whether they were more typical of a trend. So I just took that one year, 2012, and I looked at articles about trans people um, in national newspapers. And actually, funnily enough, there was a lot of similarities between those representations and the ones I'd found about Muslims um, mm. in the previous study. So they were both seen as having this kind of capacity to take offense and um, you know, being quite stroppy and unfairly demanding rights that they didn't deserve, things like that. But with trans people as well, there was a lot of kind of kind of jokey, kind of prurient focus on, on, on sexual organs, a lot of quite childish kind of sexual jokes, the kind of sort of stuff that you'd maybe hear in the playground. Um, but these were the newspapers. And there were some representations that were based on characters in films and TV, which tended to be even more negative than the ones in real life, but still influential, I think. Um, and then a lot of stories where trans people were being categorized as either criminals or victims, a lot a lot of sexualization, sex, sexualizing of them as well. So they were often written about as being involved in sex scandals with celebrities, or they were seen as not able to form relationships. So they have very transient relationships, or they were seen as, as kind of very attention seeking. So I think, you know, on the whole, the, the stories by Little John and, and Birchall were kind of the, at one end of a kind of scale where they were the kind of most kind of, I suppose, negative. But then when you look at the rest of it, there's kind of this kind of jokey, kind of quite unpleasant kind of, but still very negative stuff going on, even though it's a bit sort of more, more kind of downgraded from there. But I didn't find very much that was positive in there at all in 2012. Mm -hmm. It's it's so interesting that you say there is actually similarity between what is, you know, inherently a, a completely different uh, group of group of people in terms of um, identity and, and you'd expect the discussions to be very different. It's so interesting that there were similarities there. You've, you've returned to this more recently. And of, of course, as I mentioned in, in the last couple of years, it seems particularly there has been quite fierce um, discussions online and in the press, um, particular newspapers, especially about trans uh, rights. And in fact, the existence of um, a, a genders other than uh, the, the binary as well. Um, you returned to this question more recently, and had you noticed any improvement, or in fact, has it gotten even worse since then? Yeah, so the, the research I did, it came out as a, as a book chapter, um, and then you know, I kind of put it to one side, and we did different things, and then 
I got to know somebody who worked um, for the charity Mermaids, um, and I was kind of talking about that research with him, and he said, oh, can I see the chapter? So I sent it to him. Um, so Mermaids is a, is a charity which advocates for transgender youth. Um, so they, they you know, were fascinated and asked me if I would do a follow-up study to look at data from 2018 and 19, and then compare it back to the 2012 data. Um, so I did the kind of the same method on this, on, on, the, on this new data set. Um, and I did, I did find some improvements there. So the kind of the joking and the sexualizing cases had largely kind of gone away by, by that point. Mm. But what was replacing that was a lot more focus on, on trans people in a, a kind of more political context. So there was this term transphobia and um, about, about half the time when newspapers used it, they were kind of implying that they didn't believe it existed and they were kind of making fun of it. 15% um, of the time they used it, they used it in kind of quotes, scare quotes. Um, and when they did talk about trans people, they represented them much more likely as being kind of aggressive, um, kind of getting involved in conflict, being demanding of their rights or, or, or still as criminals as well. Um, and there was one term that particularly got a lot of flack and that is transgender lobby and whenever you see the word lobby um in a newspaper with a, a kind of another word before it it's, it's usually going to be a negative case um 91 of the references to the transgender lo lobby across the newspapers were negative so there was kind of a shift i guess away from a kind of ridiculing stance to one which is kind of much more kind of viewing trans people as a kind of political threat and kind of negative neg but still they're negative either way i see so some signs of improvement vaguely but but change as well in terms of um more of a a, a campaign i suppose uh, for for rights as opposed to just taking uh making fun of, of of individual people um that's that's really interesting because you know we see so much discussion around around these sorts of views and and there have of course been you know recent high profile cases with regards to universities as well and, and their stances uh, on on such issues too. Um, I suppose this leads nicely, you know, you mentioned some work that you've done with, with the Mermaids charity there. And so I kind of want to um, pull back a bit and, and look both at your work on uh, Islam and also your work on, on trans people and, and the representations of both of these groups in the press. Um, it's easy for, for us, I suppose, in a way to be accused of, you know, sitting here on our armchair, looking at the data and going, they're being nasty. <laughs> and then that's it. And, and you know, arguably, quite a lot of research, unfortunately, does sort of end there. A paper is published and it identifies something that's unfair or, uh, you know, um, an injustice. But then it's, you know, a lot of researchers struggle with, well, how, you know, what can we do with this? Um, but you, you, you know, are, are one of many who have done a lot of work to actually take your research and, and do something with it. So I guess if you could start generally and then and then we'll kind of go into the specifics of these two projects. But generally speaking, um, what can what sorts of contributions can can this sort of linguistic research looking at large data sets, what sorts of contributions can we reasonably expect this sort of work to make, particularly with regards to social justice, with the representations of, of minoritized groups uh, in public discourse, it is it is hard. I think to kind of you know we do this research in order to kind of hope that things will change for for the better. Um, people can't change attitudes overnight. I think, and you know, especially when you're looking at say newspaper editors, you know, they're powerful people. They've got a lot to gain from keeping things the, the way things are. So you know, they, they don't want to change. They won't change unless they they really really have to, and it's in their best interests. Mm. Um, so you know, we we we're told to do dissemination and, and you know, publishing our findings, you know, in an academic context. You know, is usually the first step. Um, you know, I think though that can only really get you know, a certain type of audience. I think um, only a very small number of famous academics can command a large audience. And I think sometimes you can feel a bit like you're kind of talking among your own community to people who agree with you anyway. Um, and, and the same if you go on social media as well. Um, so I think there are challenges, I think, in terms of learning how to, to reach out to a wider audience. Um, we, we have to, I think, accept as academics, we can only reach out so far. And, and then I think it's the case where trying to form a partnership with an organization which has a public profile um, and is able to take your findings and, and use them and publicize them, maybe maybe in ways that you can't do yourself and, and they've got kind of networks they can they can kind of key into. So I think that's one of the things that, that you know, I've, I've tried to do, um, you know, kind of 
getting my research there, trying to reach out to groups, offering to do to do research, or you know, and saying what questions have you got? Um, you know, I've got all this data. I can look at it. I can do anything I want with want with it. Really, if you've got questions, um, these are the kind of things I've looked at. But if you may have questions as well, um, and then producing reports for them um, or, or working with them to produce reports. Um, so things like that. Um, and then they can use those reports themselves in, in their own press releases or their own informational packs and things like that, um, or as part of maybe lobbying or political campaigns that they've got. So it's mm -hmm. kind of we provide them with kind of the information, then we kind of maybe take a step back um, and, 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 and hope that things happen. Um, yeah. But when we have to accept that, you know, we are, we're kind of a small cog, you know, mm. in, in a large process and a, and, a, and a very, very slowly turning wheel at that, um, which which may yeah. not turn at all. Um, yeah. And it can take a very, very long time to enact change. So I think kind of, I think sort of maybe if you, know, if you, if you start off by thinking, oh, I mean, I'm going to change the world and, you know, do this research and then the world is going to change and everyone's going to know my name. It's not going to be the case at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's going to be a very small incremental thing, um, and it yeah. is quite humbling, I think, to, you know, to, to kind of accept that and, and to know that that's you know the, the best it can be at times, and that's okay though. You know, we we're not all going to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a very very sensible uh, view, I think, to take to have reasonable expectations. Um, but you did, you know, with with going back to your work on Islam, you know, you did do. Um, quite a lot of work with with a number of of different uh, bodies, non non governmental organisations, even um, members of parliament. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, specifically, you know, how you worked with with these people and 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 how they, you know, what was their reception to to your findings? Uh, were they surprised or were they actually kind of like, well, we kind of suspected this and now we know because you, we've done this empirical uh, linguistic analysis. Yeah, so with, with the work on Islam, we worked with a, a non-governmental organization um, called Engage. Um, they, late, they later changed their name to MEND. Um, and they were kind of fascinated. They didn't know much about the approach, but they were, they were fascinated by it. And, you know, they, they, they said, oh, can you look at these words? Like, um, I think they wanted us to look at words like radicalization and, and halal, things that we hadn't looked at in our own research, but they kind of got us to look at them for them and we produced reports for them. Um, we, we collected more data, so we kind of did a, a kind of replication study with more recent data, because that's one of the things about this kind of research. By the time you've collected the corpus, done your analysis, published it, it's already about five years out of date. So, And then you're trying to get people to look at it, and they're thinking, well, what about now? So it's often a case yeah. of all constantly kind of on a treadmill, kind of redoing yeah. the study to, to get it more recent so that the media are going to care about it. Hmm. So um, we, we updated this projects for men's and then they use this information in their roadshow that they have where they visit different locations in the uk um, and talk about islam in the media um one of my co-authors tony uh, McHenry, he's given talks at mosques where he's you know outlined the findings he's also kind of advised members of the audience on ways that they can affect positive change so how to use the complaints procedures to make newspapers issue attractions and corrections when they've got something wrong or how to use um social media campaigns to raise awareness um I remember we gave a I gave a presentation um, at the Labour Party conference um, in Brighton in 2015 for MEND on our results as well. And I think there was also a House of Commons event that year um, where I showed how we could use these tools for this kind of analysis. Um, and more recently, there's a, a newer a newer organisation which is part of the Muslim Council of Britain called the Centre for Media Monitoring, and they produce these really detailed reports every few months. Um, looking at you know a range of media they do their own analysis basically and I've been on their advisory board and I, I kind of have given them advice in terms of the methods that they could use and how to kind of combine different quantitative and qualitative approaches and how to do text sampling and and actually how to do the analysis itself um, they had this big um, launch event um, at Westminster um, in in 2019. Um, and there was, there was lots of people from, from different communities um, there. And I, I remember I, they asked me to give a speech there. Um, and the, actually, I, think I was so impressed. They had the editors of The Sun and The Express there as well, who actually um, spoke as well. And they signaled that they wanted their newspapers to change. So, you know, that, wow. was, that was really encouraging to see, um, you know, that, that, that you know, this, this group was actually getting editors to come along and to listen. Um, and, and to signify that they wanted to change too. So it, it did feel like I was kind of, you know, a small part of something bigger, which was lovely. Wow, goodness. I, I, I didn't know that, that they'd actually come as well and, and sort of made some um, promises. That's very interesting. Would, would you say then that, that in general, this sort of work of, 
uh, as you said before, it's it's a it's a popular area of study looking at um, representations in in the news media. Um, is it about in terms of the the efforts to enact some kind of change and make some sort of impact, convincing or, or encouraging journalists and editors to give people a fair shot at being represented fairly? I mean, the press, of course, are well entitled to criticize people for various legitimate reasons, um, and and I don't think anybody would say that that's that's a problem. But it's the criticism based on identity. Uh, based on inherent, you know, variation or diversity that that we're trying to avoid, is, is it about encouraging those who have the power to dictate these representations simply to just, you know, give people a fair chance? I think it is. I think you know, it's. I think it's not all newspapers and it's not all editors and it's not all journalists. You know, even within a single newspaper, you can have have different stances. I think. Um, but you know, as I was saying earlier, I think newspapers do, you know, have a, you know, the capacity to 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 lead and to influence attitudes as well. So they, they have an awful lot of power. And you know, sometimes kind of picking on a group which you know doesn't really have much of a voice for itself, um, you know, it, it's not it's not a kind thing to do. I think um, it kind of you know it, it it doesn't make us look good as a society. I think I think if we're you know, picking on people who can't fight back and, and, you know, and haven't done anything wrong for that matter either. Or maybe there's a very small, you know, maybe, you know, five or six people within a, you know, who share a certain identity trait, but then everybody who has that identity trait get labelled with the same kind of mm. negative things because one person in that group did something terrible or something like that. But they're kind of massively exceptional um, and, and, and the kind of one-off case, but then it kind of, it kind of gets transferred to everybody else. So, yeah, I think it, it is kind of trying to get get you know newspapers to to think about changing. It is very difficult, as I said. They you know these these stories you know that are based upon negative emotions and, and getting other people to feel better about themselves by putting other people down. Um, you know they do sell stories and they do get clicked upon. Um, and I think there are challenges. I think in terms of learning how to reach out. Um, you know to newspapers. Newspapers hate reporting on themselves, especially if it's negative. So, you know, and we did have trouble, you know, getting, you know, our, our results to be disseminated within other newspapers, because basically we, you know, we're saying to them, you know, write stories about yourself, which aren't very positive, and they don't want yeah. to do that. Um, <laughs> I remember one of the early studies we were involved in, we were looking at the refugees and asylum seekers um, representations in the press. And I remember at the end, we wrote this press release, um, we kind of put it, we got our university to put it out there and it got absolutely zero attention <laughs> because <laughs> nobody wanted to write about that. that, mm. that. And, um, you know, I think also it was our first try at doing a press release um, and we'd use a kind of form of language that was far too technical. Um, you know, I think it's, it's one of those things you learn how to kind of change your writing style. When, you know, when you're writing as academic, you write in one way. And then when you write kind of for the wider audience, you have to change your the words you used. Um, and I think, you know, now when we write these things, we... We try and kind of get it down to short bullet points, kind of takeaway points that can be turned into headlines quite easily. But even then, I think newspapers often do not want to write about, you know, themselves, particularly if it's in a negative light, which is understandable. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting that um, funny that how they they weren't so keen to <laughs> report on that. <laughs> okay, well, um, as we as we wind things down here on the the first episode of. Corpus Cast. I'm uh, still getting used to that name. Um, I've, I've I've prepared uh, what I call quick questions, but um, I've been around long enough to know that academics uh, don't do quick answers. Um, so even if the questions are quick, I, the answer might not be. So th that's okay. That's okay. Um, you you mentioned earlier that you started your career in the the 1990s. Um, what what are the biggest changes that you've noticed in corpus research between then and now? Hmm. So I think I think there's been a, a change of scale. Um, so I remember at the start, 100 million words was a lot. Now it's kind of, you know, the norm, I think, to you know, um, for, for tools to be able to deal with that. And now, you know, there are a corporate of billions of words. I remember at the time there wasn't a lot of focus on online context of language, and that's now increasingly the norm. Um, so two of the later projects I've been involved in, one involved looking at um, the feedback that people have left to the National Health Service on the website when they've been patients, and so kind of um, that patient feedback responses. And then at the moment, I'm looking at an, um, an online health support forum for people who have uh, people with anxiety. 
Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lot easier, I think, to collect that kind of data because it's online anyway. Um, and even when I look at newspaper reporting now, which is a very traditional form of text, for the last couple of projects, I've tried to make sure that um, I focus on the reader comments to the articles as well as the articles themselves. Mm. So it does mean it's easier to collect data, but it also means that issues around copyright and ethics, I think, get increasingly complicated. Um, you know, if you're, if you're collecting tweets, for example, um, you know, you don't, you can't go write to every person who collected a tweet and say, "Can I have your tweet in my corpus?" It just wouldn't be feasible to do that. And then, when you're analysing the tweets and you want to maybe quote an example, and maybe it's quite an unpleasant example, you know, do you want to kind of, you know, kind of humiliate potentially somebody because they could then somebody else can then Google that tweet, find it online, and then maybe put in a complaint about them? And maybe it's a child who wrote the tweet. Um, so that you know that can be can be really difficult anyway. So. I think it, it is it is hard, and there are kind of questions that we're kind of you know as as a kind of community coupling with its community, we're kind of still grappling with over things mm -hmm. like ethics and copyright, um, and hopefully we will eventually get there and, and get some answers. Yeah, and, and absolutely. I'm, it's it's amazing to sort of track um, how quickly things have changed in in that regard, particularly as you say with with online ethics um, and and the scale as well. Um, of of the the data, you know, and I'm talking to my students um, about corpus linguistics uh, as we do here on our, our English language programs here at uh, Aston. Um, <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're often very surprised uh, about just how large some of these data sets can be. And and you're right, it's it's not always been that way at all. Um, what surprised you the most about your own work? in in corpus linguistics i appreciate this might be a difficult question but i'm just curious what what are the biggest surprises for you i think i think i've been surprised at the range of ways i've been able to use this techniques over the years so you know back in 97 when i was doing this part of speech tagging checking of the bnc i had no idea you know what was going to happen in the next 20 years or so and since then i've looked at newspaper articles patient feedback online health forums um, i've looked at violent propaganda magazines political speech, television scripts, um, student writing, personal adverts, e even erotic stories. Um, and they've all wow. told me something about human nature. They've told me something I didn't know about the kind of human condition and how humans use language to kind of get a point across or an attitude across. And I think that's really what I'm most interested in. I'm most interested in people and what people are like. And what what I love about corporate linguistics is how these techniques can point you to a, a relatively innocent looking word like I or me, um, and then when you start to investigate it, it tells you something about how people are using a word which you'd never have thought to look at if you were left to kind of just follow your own train of thought. So, so every time I do um, a new project and I start with a new corpus, it's a bit like playing with a puzzle box. And yeah. I'm using all these different techniques to get these of these little kind of jewels or gems of information that <laughs> nobody else knows yet. And, and every single time, I think it's different. And is interesting and keeps wants me wanting to kind of keep on doing it and going back and doing it with a, a different data set and that's what gets me to get up in the morning i think which is great <laughs> oh it's great to hear that you're so motivated by this i, I like that metaphor <laughs> um okay so finally of course we're going to look to the future now um how will corpus linguistics <laughs> uh continue to make or or even make an even bigger impact uh on society in the future um, I'm not sure I can predict, but I can make some mm. suggestions, I think, for how I hope it would. Um, mm. So I, I, I hope it would help make people become a bit more cynical, I think, or critical about the ways that language use, is used to influence us, and consequently also about the impact that our own language choices have on others. And I think it has the potential to make us better communicators, but also to be more, more savvy receivers of language. Um, you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, we don't get taught this at school. And I actually mm. think it would be great to have these techniques and concepts from corporate linguistics to be on the national curriculum mm. and to be taught in schools so that everyone has access to these methods of making sense of language. And, you know, people are increasingly computer literate. And I think, you know, using a corpus should be as easy as consulting a dictionary. Um, and it's just so, so fascinating as well, I think, to kind of to think about, you know, kind of everybody becoming a kind of, you know, potential to have the potential to be a corpus researcher. I do think that it has the potential to affect real social change. The findings that you know you get from this are, are large enough to mm. be generalizable and they're obtained in a relatively fair and unbiased way, even if you've got biases yourself. You know, you can't you have to make sense of what the computer is telling you the patterns are. You can't just pick them out. So what you end up with is, is a more convincing um, analysis rather than just a kind of 
polemic. The challenge then, I think, though, is you get loads of findings and it's kind of putting that in an interesting narrative to make it engaging, I think, for, for readers to kind of respond to and, and kind of understand. Well, lots of food for thought there. Uh, I completely agree. Um, and, and that brings us to uh, the close of our first ever episode of Corpus Cast, hopefully the first of many. Uh, you never know, we could have you back on our 10th anniversary or 20th anniversary, many years to come. Um, Paul Baker, <laughs> Professor of English Language at Lancaster University, thank you so much for being our first guest. It really means a lot. And this was such a fascinating conversation. So thank you very much, Paul. Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Robbie.